Yeah, that looks like it. Doesn't it's it? a bridge. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> one title, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so if I stand close to you, because if you uh -huh. if you put your microphone on, is it on you? Yeah, yes. And I'll just stand close to you and okay. then it'll be picked up in the microphone so we can look like we're best buddies. Okay, so our last talk for today is um, Lara, Sp uh, how do you pronounce your name? Spiker. Spiker, there we yeah. go. Um, who's going to, I've, I've, I've seen Lara talk before about UCL Press and of course Rip it, um, referred to UCL Press as well. Um, it's quite exciting, it's a, the newest um, press, university press I think at the moment, isn't it? It's still the newest. First fully open access. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so which is great, and I think really the, the, the way of the future. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. Thank you, Danny, and uh, thank you for having me here today. I'm very aware that um, lunch has arrived, <laughs> and so you're probably all hungry. I'll just pass um, a couple of our catalogues around. Um, yes, yeah, so we um, UCL Press has. Danny said. Um, it's, it's one of the newer uh, university presses that started. It's, it was launched in June 2015 as the first fully open access university press um, in the UK and I'll explain a bit more about what that, what that actually means. So I'll talk about our mission and background, why we were set up, uh, the type of publishing we've been doing since we set up, um, the downloads and sales that we've achieved and then some of our uh, future plans. And for the audience today, I think what's, what will perhaps be um, interesting is why an institution would do this. Why would an institution set up a fully open access press in the first place, which is, of course, very different, as we heard from Cambridge, from most of the other uh, models that uh, university presses run on um, at the moment. And also, I hope this will, al uh, will also show why researchers should publish open access, what, what the benefits can be, which I know Rupert already talked about quite a lot. Um, so this is uh, the, the mission of um, UCL Press, one of them, um, the key one, um, as uh, articulated by David Price, our Vice Provost for Research. Um, so ensuring that the products of UCL's research um, and others, because we don't just publish UCL authors, but ensuring that the products of research are made as widely available as possible. So that's the, the key mission, which is very different from the usual um, scholarly press model. Or maybe not, because although they, uh, many university presses and scholarly presses say that that is the model, as Rupert has shown, the market does not deliver this. So we are trying to deliver this um, by publishing open access. And I think what's interesting here is an institution taking a real interest in what happens to its research when it's done, when it goes out there. And usually that's really just left to the academic to find the publisher um, and, and then it, it goes out there somewhere. But this is the institution really thinking about what happens to that research and what the possibilities are for it. Um, so some of the benefits of having uh, a university press at your institution that is open access, um, we're supporting, I won't read them all out, but we're supporting um, uh, humanities and social sciences, which receive less funding, there's global impact, um, the opportunity for the integration of research and learning, which we'll see later with some of our student work, uh, the added reputation it brings to the university through the global dissemination, the, the book reviews, uh, the social impact, and this key, um, this key point about low dissemination of scholarly monographs. And the first one, taking publishing back into the university system and how the university can and, and should support the entire research life cycle. Um, a few quick facts about us. I mentioned we launched in, um, in June. There's, we have a team of uh, four and a half or maybe five, I think, now. Um, we're open to all authors, but we started really from the base of, of UCL. Uh, we fund UCL authors. Um, we do make a charge to non-UCL authors, a book processing charge, which is typical for most open access publishers, but we try and keep ours as low as possible. Um, it's, it might seem really obvious for, for there to be a point up there to say our books are copy edited um, and typeset um, and peer reviewed, but this is something I was getting asked a lot when we set up the press by authors. 
would we provide all those services that they would normally expect from their publisher? And so we, uh, we made very sure that, that those services um, were included in what we were doing and were of a high standard and that everything we publish is rigorously peer reviewed. Um, when we set up, we didn't focus on any particular subject areas, but these subject areas are the ones where we seem to be um, receiving quite, um, quite a lot of proposals. Uh, we're now publishing about 35 books a year, so that's from our first books two and a half years ago to now. Um, and I won't go really into the detail of, of the process of how we publish and, and how we select and how we peer review, because that's been, I think, covered really well by, um, by some of the previous talks. We are a department of the library, um, and that is also quite unusual in university press publishing in the UK, but becoming um, more and more prevalent um, in the US, for example. So all our books are published and available free to download online via our website and on other places, which I'll show later. Um, they're also available um, to buy in print. So we, like Rupert, we do everything simultaneously. Um, here are some of the reasons that um, some of our authors say that they want to publish in this way. Um, again, the question of reaching a wide audience comes up again and again, uh, reaching the global south. Um, and one of the things I find most interesting about this is um, we, um, so I th a lot of what we're doing is challenging a lot of perceived wisdom about scholarly publishing. And one of them um, is about um, academics who are worried about publishing with their own press because they're worried about the vanity press accusation. And so many university presses actually publish very few of their own academics, uh, which raises a lot of interesting questions about, about their purpose. Um, we have a lot of proposals coming from UCL academics who specifically say they want to publish with their home university press not because it's easier, not because they think you know, they're going to be able to publish uh, with us because they've been turned down by a lot of other people, but as the first choice and because they want to support their institution and what we're doing. And I think that's a really interesting sea change in academic choice. These are some of the things we've published. Um, as you saw earlier, we publish quite a lot of anthropology, um, archaeology, um, and um, we're interested to see as well that we're getting proposals through from academics for popular science. Um, so, for example, a conversation about healthy eating and sustainable food systems, um, Bloomsbury scientists. So um, that, that was something very unexpected. Um, we, we really didn't think uh, would happen, but we, we absolutely uh, want to support. Um, this particular um, series has been, um, has been very uh, popular. We've had a lot of downloads of this series and um, I just thought I'd highlight this um, because this is uh, also a point that Rupert mentioned earlier that um, for some subjects such as anthropology, especially when it's uh, situated in, in many different countries, um, the, the authors of, of these, uh, these books really wanted to reach the subjects of the books. And the only way really to do that was via open access. Um, and this was a, a, a really, this was a collaborative project where um, the Why We Post research project had thought about monograph outputs as one of their many outputs, along with videos and blogs and journal articles, um, they had thought about this right at the beginning of the project. So having monographs in there and how they were going to publish them and how we were going to jointly promote them as a press, as a project, as an institution was embedded right from the beginning. And I think that makes for a really successful um, combination. Um, Rupert mentioned earlier we also do um, digital books. So uh, we have done books with um, that are uh, some of them highly illustrated, some of them academic. This one has 3D, has um, slideshows. You can zoom on the images. Um, there's video and audio embedded. This is the Academic Book of the Future uh, project that uh, Rupert mentioned earlier. And this has been picked up by quite a lot of um, researchers, both inside UCL and outside UCL, who are very interested in this model 
of, of the living book that you can add to over time. It's not going to stand still. So these books, we will continue to, um, the editors will continue to commission articles and they will go up gradually over time. And this also includes videos and blogs as well as journal articles, some of them um, quite long. Um, we also publish academic journals. I won't go into that too much. Um, and we also publish student journals. And um, I think this is another key thing that um, uh, an institutional uh, press who's uh, supported by its institution, uh, rather than having to make a profit or cover its costs, can actually support the institution's activities and its strategy in a very wide range of ways. Uh, so we're able to support, um, at the moment, eight student journals, but, but growing interest. And we're setting up and running their own journal. And uh, we provide the platform, we provide the uh, publishing um, advice, and we guide them through the setting up process or the transfer, because some of these journals, uh, one of them, Object, which is just down the bottom, it's an art history um, graduate journal, has been going for about 15 years in print. Um, but the, the department found that they were ending up at the end of uh, the year with lots of print copies left over. They didn't have the dissemination mechanism. It wasn't reaching people. And so they transferred to, to this site. And now they've, they've really found they're getting a lot more engagement and a lot more submissions. So it really, this really helps students and fits um, with, um, there might be something similar at Cambridge at um, UCL, we have the connected curriculum uh, where um, students are encouraged to learn um, through participation in research. And this very much uh, meets uh, that goal. These are some of the ways that we um, distribute our books. Um, so we put them on a variety of open access platforms. They're available from our platform, but they're also available through JSTOR, um, OAPEN is the um, kind of standard <coughs> open access platform in Europe, uh, which, has, uh, which also works with the Directory of Open Access Books. So that's where people can easily find open access books. Um, we work closely with our university's uh, press office and communications to get support so that we're, um, they're helping us to promote um, the books. Um, in terms of dissemination, this came up earlier in James's um, talk. Um, OAPEN makes MARC records um, available to libraries, so you've got that channel. Um, and the British Library accepts digital uh, deposit. I don't know if, you, if you've explored that yet, but mm -hmm. they are very keen to accept digital deposit because they're running out of space. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's... Uh, and... Um, I'll just mention JSTOR because um, we JSTOR launched, most of you probably know JSTOR, do you? Yeah. So JSTOR um, launched an open access monographs, um, monograph platform um, about a year ago and four publishers joined initially. We were one of them. And uh, we've just um, had a research, um, a piece of research done on the, uh, the downloads so far and the, the, the usage of the books when they're on JSTOR. And um, I wanted to highlight this because it really echoes what Rupert was saying about um, it, it's very clear from that research that uh, when the books are freely available, they are reaching all around the world. You see high usage in the global south and we see high usage from, um, from users who are not already in the JSTOR platform and they are coming from um, outside um, indicating that people from outside academia are accessing this, which is great. That's what we want to, um, to encourage. Um, part of uh, why I put this slide up is because um, we've, we've found, as a, as a press starting from scratch, that um, we, we were concerned that while open access um, is freely available and you put it up online, how are people going to find it? Putting it on a platform like JSTOR is one way, but we do believe that supporting um, the, uh, the activities with marketing is really important to help the communities find these books. So, so we do send out books for, for book review, and we're finding that's really working. Books are getting picked up in the national press and in the Times Higher, 
and in specialist journals, and that's really important, I think, for researchers as well. They want to know that, that the publisher is doing that kind of work. And we do, um, we do a lot on, on social media as well. Um, so, in terms of downloads, and I'll compare with some of our print statistics um, as well, which, which is quite interesting. Um, so, in the two and a half years, we've published 52 books, and they've been downloaded um, over 500,000 times. Um, so, when um, I, I hear a lot in discussions about open access that there is a concern that open access books are discoverable, whether or not they are discoverable. But I would say the concern should be whether or not the printed book is discoverable. Because here we're seeing an average of, what, around 10,000 per book? That ranges massively from some of our books are downloaded 1,000 times, some of them 150,000. Um, so th there's a huge variation, but they're clearly being discovered and read. Whereas in the traditional model, Rupert mentioned around 200 um, copies, uh, a <coughs> recent study, Academic Book of the Future, uh, which came out in the summer, um, indicated that um, monograph book sales might have dwindled even further than that, um, and even questions whether the current model is viable, if, if that is the case, if those print sales just continue to dwindle. So we would say, on this basis, that open access books are very discoverable. Um, these are our most downloaded books, so you can see we have one that's been downloaded 150,000 times, in a year and a half, and then the kind of 10, 20,000 is, is fairly typical, depending on how long it's been published for. Um, I was quite surprised that half of our downloads are in the US. We're not specifically promoting our books in the US, but, but maybe through JSTOR, etc., that, that would explain it. Um, but you can see that the range of countries, um, you know, in that top 10 or so, is, is really quite widespread. Um, our print sales average um, around 100 to 200 copies in the first year of publication, um, up to 500 or so for um, the, the social media book that's been the most popular um, download. Um, so we would say they're holding up pretty well, um, despite the fact that they're open access. And also our promotional activity is focused on making the open access visible. It's not focused on pushing print sales, uh, which traditional publishers do have to do. They have to invest effort into selling that print copy through traditional channels. We're making it available through those channels, but it's not our main focus by any means. So on that basis, I think they're holding up pretty well, but we have found that um, EPUB sales and Kindle sales are small, and, and we think clearly that the digital version is being cannibalised by the OA uh, PDF version. I don't know if Rupert has found similar things or... Kindle, uh, we, we find that Kindle actually, that because it's, coming, it's bringing an audience through from Amazon, you yeah. might not be discovering it any other way. So that does seem to... That does for you. This slide speaks to um, the fact that um, we have just made our print books available in the UK. That's why most of them are sold in the UK. Uh, but we've recently um, started working with Chicago University Press to help uh, get our print books out there in the US. That's also not just to sell the print books, but also to promote the brand uh, and raise awareness. And we'll be doing the same for wider European distribution. <coughs> um, these are just some of the nice tweets we've had uh, recently about a book. We, we published a book about the connected curriculum at, at UCL. Um, which has been picked up uh, quite, a, quite heavily just in its first um, three weeks. So that's the kind of reaction um, that the books are getting and, and why authors are so pleased that they feel they're reaching this, this readership that they want to. Um, just very quickly um, on some of our future plans, we are going to be uh, publishing textbooks. Uh, we've published um, a couple already and we feel this is a really a problematic area again and something we want to help address and it fits with our strategy um, for the, the student experience at, at UCL. So these are some of the textbooks we've got coming. Um, we recently announced um, a call for textbooks 
um, which uh, for which we got a pretty good response. We've got about 10 or 15 more in the pipeline and, and this is something we want to actively build on. Um, not in any particular subject areas um, yet, but, but we'll see. Um, and uh, that's one of the books that we've published so far, one of the textbooks. Um, and that's the other one. Um, that was the call. So those are the, the, kinds, of, um, the kinds of things we're looking for um, in our textbooks. Um, so both ones that, that are tailored to particular UCL programmes, but also ones that, that might uh, reach more, more widely. Um, and we are also planning to offer publishing services to other institutions who um, have seen what UCL Press has done and what open access can achieve, um, who, who don't necessarily feel that they have the um, in-house uh, resources or um, skills to set up their own publishing operation, um, where we could work in the background to, to help them do that. Um, so these are the things we're going to be focusing on um, over the coming years, as well as um, continuing to, to build the, um, the programme. Thank you. <laughs> Did I get out of the question? They want lunch. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes. Hi, I'm just wondering, do you also have the embedded media in the way that open books Yeah, we, we can do. We, um, interestingly, we haven't had um, a huge number of requests to do that within the PDF, but in the online platform, um, I showed a bit earlier, that's where we um, include um, the, um, so th this is browser based rather than downloadable, but in there we put video, <laughs> audio, 3D, etc. And we, we have got a book coming, I think, just before Christmas called Musical Cities, which is in the catalogue, which is digital only, because it has so much uh, media embedded in it and just wouldn't really work in any other way. Yeah, so we're, we're open to, to all those things. Hello. I'm thinking about the financial model of this and how I'm assuming that UCL puts in a subsidy system, but what is it, it, how much sort of revenue do you get from print sales or uh, e-book sales? And what, how does it sustain itself? And for UCL staff, you're saying there's no charge, but for that, it's purely a, it's a without any charge, you say? Yeah. So, so um, institutional subsidy system. Yeah, yes. Yes, so the institution funds it. The institution um, sees the model of scholarly publishing uh, that is uh, covering its costs or making a profit and doesn't really agree with it. And it feels that the institution should be ensuring that its research is widely read, that to do that uh, properly and to a high standard does cost money, and that in the open access model, the, uh, the revenues are not necessarily going to cover all those costs. It's happy to do that because its key, um, its key goal is to ensure that wide dissemination. So it sees it as a cost like um, the university library is, is not m meant to uh, cover its costs or make a profit and many other departments are the same and it's viewing it in that way. Can you put a rough figure on each one? Oh, put a rough figure on each on monograph. Each well, we, we charge £5,000 for a book processing charge to non-UCL authors, um, which is quite low. I suppose um, BPCs range from around three to up to 12 um, from some commercial um, publishers. So that's the rough production costs. And then, of course, we do have staff and, and marketing. Any other questions? While we've got not everybody in the room, a couple of people who've spoken today have left. Um, but is there any questions just for the people who are still remaining? Things that may have arisen subsequently listening to a later I wonder whether for that question of one of the previous speakers, just while we're here. Okay, so 
So for example, we, we have, I mean, what I just found out is the, the second largest story of all time in Cambridge. Um, the largest story is something about uh, educational aid, the right age for children to start education, which gets retweeted all the time on various um, you know, <laughs> discussion lists and so on. So it will probably remain the second largest story for all time, which is the release of Stephen Hawking's thesis open access. It's gone completely viral. It's crashed uh, our site. That thing made that story went viral. We've had uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, we've had 5.3 million hits on the page. Um, now that does not necessarily mean. Can you hear? Or do I need to talk in the um, That doesn't necessarily mean 5.3 million people have. So what we then have to do is, is narrow down and look at different IP addresses. So that's the information that we then would say there have been this many visitors, right? So that person may have tried to hit it six or 17 times because the thing won't load because it's crashed. But um, so the hits would count 17. There's one visitor. So there are ways of disaggregating that information. They also, I mean, Google Analytics and things, I mean, it's a, it, it is an issue, is, uh, you know, even at that stage, you know, I, IP addresses are shared uh, quite often, universities will share them across lots of places. And so what is the session, you know, what is the session? Um, it's really difficult uh, if somebody, you know, goes one week and then comes back six months later, you know, to be able to tie those together. And not only that, there's, there is, for me anyway, a, a privacy issue that do you want to be monitoring who is reading? Do, do, do you actually want to be collecting the statistics that would allow you to say that that academic has been accessing the work? Because then somebody might want to know that information. And would, do I really want to report that you've been reading that? You know, so there is a privacy issue sitting in the back as well, just to add complications to it. But it is a valid question because um, it's very, we do a lot of work to, because bots jump in as well. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's not a real person. So um, we, we, when, we, when we talk about our statistics, we have to be quite careful about what we're actually saying so that we're honest about what we're saying and it's not misinterpreted. So there's a difference between a view and a download. So just because like we have many millions of people have looked at the record because they've gone, oh, that sounds vaguely interesting and clicked on it, does not mean they've downloaded the work. And even if they have, it doesn't mean they've read it. So there, you know, it's damn lies and damn statistics, et cetera, et cetera. But what we do know is that if 200 uh, libraries have bought a copy of the book, because they're the only people who can afford a printed copy of a book, um, and clearly, obviously, people can borrow that, so it's not that 200 people will, are the only people who ever see it, but those numbers are low, and we definitely know that. There's no question about it, and they're not anything like the tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of downloads. Yeah. Can I, can I also add, you know, there's these studies now that Princeton has done looking at their purchase policies and looking at how many times the books that they purchased are used. And less than 50% of the books that they purchased are e actually ever, ever borrowed, ever engaged with. So, yeah, 200 libraries have bought it. <laughs> and, and then people will say, oh, but lots of people, have, but actually half of those books will have sat on the library shelf collecting dust. And there's complications with that because just because they're borrowed doesn't mean they're not being read. You should look at which shelving. No, it would, actually, I should have, and that's the Come statistic the they've got, yeah. So, yeah. which they can do. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. It's a reshelving. Yeah. The but, same problem we've but, got. Yeah. But, it's, but it's there because now they've got barcodes, they can scan it when they reshelf. So it's terrible. It's awful, isn't it? I mean, the readership is just, it's just terrible. <laughs> I also look, as, as well as agreeing with, with what uh, Danny and Ruth have said, we also just look at from a common sense in our downloads in terms of which books would we expect to be more of more of greater interest. So a book on global on, on social media usage around the world you would expect to be really popular and a book on reconstructive plastic surgery? <laughs> yeah, that's been pretty popular. Actually, actually. Been really popular. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Dutch football, you know, in a period of twenty years or something in the in the Netherlands, you would expect that to have a narrow readership and those kind of thing you can see played out in the download figures. So we, if we saw something really unexpected, you know, you know, why has that been viewed 200,000 times? We, we would be alert to that. So. Is there a yeah. comment on the Philip, the one the, um, Philip Cohen's presentation about this appears to me when I was listening to that, what, I mean, how is, what the pros and cons of this platform would set up with academia? <coughs> 
Okay, I might just. Um, is it okay to continue this conversation like this? If you, if you do need to go, don't, don't be embarrassed. You can, you can feel free to go. Um, okay, so does everyone know about academia.edu? Have they heard of it? And, an, and an, another version is ResearchGate. And they're, they're academic sharing network work sites. Um, and it's basically a place where you can upload your research paper and other people can, can follow you as a person or um, follow any discussions relating to that particular paper. And um, it's a good way of collaborating, it's a good way of meeting other people in your field. However, academia.edu, academia despite the .edu, is not academically associated. It's a commercial company. Um, they've actually changed the law now about whether or not you could use edu. They got in before that law changed. So it's not what it seems on the package. ResearchGate is bigger, but it's the same thing. They tend to specialise in different disciplines. So you'll, usually a, 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 an area will, will be in one or the other, not in both, usually. Um, so. Uh, the problem with them is that they are commercial companies, they are very, very vague on copyright, all care, no responsibility. So they do tell you you're supposed to have the rights to upload your paper. Most researchers haven't got the foggiest idea what that means. So they just chuck up the PDF illegally. Um, they are very aggressive in their marketing. So they will find something of yours and harass you until you make it available. All of my work is published open access and there's copies in the repository. You cannot not find my work. And yet they'll say, upload it, upload it, upload it. I don't need to upload it. It is online in several places, right? So what they're creating is the mother of all repositories, particularly ResearchGate. At any point, ResearchGate could flip a switch and start charging. And you have no control over that. And in fact, right now, ResearchGate and Elsevier are in a very big legal tussle because Elsevier is saying, you need to take down all your illegal material out of ResearchGate because we are going to sue you. Right, so they're, they're, they're going at ResearchGate and not at their researchers right now, which is good. But yeah, so, so I'm not saying don't engage because it is a useful way of finding colleagues and so on. But just be conscious that if you want to put something into something like academia.edu or ResearchGate, make it a legal version of the work. And that's your author's accepted manuscript. That's your peer-reviewed, corrected version of the work. Now, if you're producing a peer-reviewed, corrected version of a work that's been accepted for publication, you have a requirement to deposit it to the university's Apollo repository. We will put it in the repository. We will um, observe any embargo periods that are required by the publisher. You are then able to claim it in the next ref. You have fulfilled your requirements uh, to the university, you've made your work available, and there is an online freely available copy at that point. We have in the repository something called request a copy, which means if it is under embargo, you can request it and get a hold of the copy of the work. So it is actually available, even though it's not openly available. Um, so that is a legal way of doing it. And if you want to use ResearchGate or so on, you can always point to the repository version. So that's the legal way of going about doing these things. So they are, um, so I yeah, know, and, and one, one thing I just want to say before Lawrence leaps in um, is that like Facebook, academia.edu and ResearchGate, you are the product, right? You're, you're giving them data that they are then going to sell. So you just need to be aware of that. Sorry, uh, Lawrence. <laughs> And that's what our service will do for you. So can I just reiterate that last bit, that you are the product? Because that's exactly what they're doing. It goes back to this privacy issue. They are collecting the data over your usage and selling that back to university faculties, to, to other places. So that, that, that is where they're going to monetize this platform, is selling you. So your knowledge and your acquisition of knowledge becomes, you know, sold. And, you know, do you want people to buy what you've been looking at? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. As, anyway. an as an indication of the kind of cost of that sort of thing, we uh, contacted Clarivate, which is the company that owns the citation information. Um, and we want to know, who, uh, what, what are our Cambridge people citing? And so we said to Clarivate, can you, can you tell us this information, please? Yes, we can, for £11,000, just to give you an idea. 
of the kind of money we're talking about in data about research. That, that's the kind of figures we're talking about. And that's small. Anyway, on that really rather depressing note, um, we'll close the, close the event and please uh, enjoy the lunch and enjoy the conversation over lunch. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>